wanna jump into this new series called Eyewitness. And last week we talked about how there were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And we wanna talk about some of those stories for the next couple of weeks here. And I thought what I would do this morning is just start with a question that's on my mind as I, as I came to the story we'll be looking at. And it's, ha- have you ever had a moment with someone where you needed to hear something and they said the exact words you needed at the exact time you needed them? In other words, you were going through something and someone, maybe they knew what you were going through, maybe they didn't know what you were going through, but for whatever reason, when they encountered you, they said blank and it made an impact. Now, of course, this impact can be very life-giving and positive and good. Of course, there's other times when you need to hear something that builds you up and the words actually cut you down a little bit and that, that wounds and that hurts. But there's a time in our lives where hopefully each of us can say, you know what? I was walking through something hard and someone spoke into my life and it might've just been a simple sentence, a simple word. It might've even just been, they were very good at being present and didn't over talk to you about the situation either. You know, when I was growing up, my dad had this phrase that he, I, I think he still uses it with me when I'm getting advice from him or we're just processing stuff. You know, I, I remember as a young person having some anxiety about this next thing that's gonna happen, this next future thing I've got to deal with. And my dad has this phrase and it's probably one you've heard because it's not um, original with him, but he always would tell me, hey, Kurt, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Have you ever heard that? We'll cross that bridge when we get there. And, and, and when, he, when he said it, it was so sincere. And, and you'll notice that uh, it was we, it wasn't you. You can cross that. It was we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And for me, that was always so life-giving and invited me to pause for a moment and, and say, yes, I have stress. I, I'm struggling here, but I know, number one, I'm not alone in that stress. And number two, I can actually do all that I can to be present to what's real right now. And when that time comes, that next obstacle I foresee comes, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And it would calm me so much. You know, maybe you have had moments where you were struggling with a relationship and someone spoke into that moment about your identity wasn't tied to that relational thing you were going through. Or someone called out a gift that they saw in you, a calling that they noticed in you, something about your character where they said, look, I see you living this way and I want you to know that you have something to offer. And they called it out. They spoke truth when it was needed. Maybe you've had a moment where you were deviating from the best path for your life, perhaps with God, and and someone was actually in a humble and respectful way able to say, hey, I'm concerned because I'm noticing this. And because of who they are and because of their posture, you received it not as judgment, but as invitation to be aware that there's something better for you than what you're headed towards. See, words well-timed have power, and we've all hopefully experienced the power of well-timed words. And what I want us to do this morning as we step into this first story about people who experienced Jesus after the resurrection is I wanna invite us to a simple idea, but it's a profound idea if we take it seriously. And we're gonna flesh this out for the next few moments together. And it's simply this, what would it look like to use your words like Jesus? What would it look like to use your words like Jesus? Jesus. Jesus, of course, is a master of words. He speaks truth in love. He calls people to their best. And what we're going to see today is that he knows exactly what people need, and he speaks it. And he speaks it in a profound way. 
So the, for the next few moments, that's what I want to do. I want us to look at this post-resurrection moment, this moment where Jesus is stepping into a situation and says what needs to be said. We're going to be in John chapter 20, and now I want to just kind of recap what John 20 has done. John 20 is one account of the resurrection, and in the John version of the story, we hear about this moment that Jesus has with a woman named Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary is someone who was a disciple of Jesus, who followed Jesus, and she is a witness to the resurrection, has this beautiful encounter, and then she runs and tells all the other disciples, uh, hey, I've seen the Lord, but they have not yet seen the Lord at this point. And so the story keeps on going, and we're going to start with this moment where the whole, most of the disciples actually get to see Jesus. And this is what it says in John 20, verse 19. It says, it was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. I wanna, I wanna pause here. I want you to notice what's going on. The disciples have seen Jesus executed and they are afraid. Now you can imagine the amount of trauma of having your leader killed. This isn't a casual fear. This is a deep, profound sense of we don't know what's next. Our leader has been killed. They were afraid. And so what does Jesus speak into their lives? The first thing Jesus says is peace be with you. Not hey, you shouldn't be afraid, right? He just says, peace be with you. It continues in verse 20. It says, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Of course, this is where his wounds were. He was nailed to a executioner's cross with his hands. And of course, the story tells us that Um, He was wounded with a spear that kind of made sure he was dead. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. In other words, you have a job to do. Go proclaim the message of forgiveness. So, Jesus steps into a fearful group of disciples who are thoroughly experiencing trauma and pain and confusion. They've just heard from one person Uh, Jesus is missing. Uh, I saw Jesus raised, and they're like, no, no, no. And it's in this moment that everything changes for them. And it's really important that we understand this word peace for ancient Jewish people. This is not just feel really good so that you're not anxious, although it can include that. Peace is this word that we talk about once in a while around here, shalom. And shalom is this idea of holistic, like, rightness. Like, everything that is in relationship to a person and to a community and to the world, it's all in harmony. My relationship with myself, my relationship with others, my relationship with God, my relationship to the soil itself, this is all in harmony. And so Jesus steps in and says, look, peace be with you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry. But peace be with you also implies when you go from here, 
you are a carrier of shalom. You are a carrier of peace. In fact, you are a, as Jesus says elsewhere, you are peacemakers. This isn't just a feeling, it's active. It's relational. It adds something to the nature of how they live. It adds something to the nature of how we live. Have you ever needed a little bit more shalom in your life? Have you ever needed some relational togetherness with people in your life that things just seem to go wrong with? Jesus says, peace be with you. And so what can we take from this eyewitness account of Jesus in this gospel? And, and, and what do we witness together as we read the story? I want to give you a couple of thoughts and, and, and just invite us to try these on this morning. And the first one is, what if we used our words like Jesus? Words of peace, not fear. We've been talking about this already. Words of peace, not fear. You know, oftentimes we, have you ever been in a conversation with someone who, when you're in that conversation, you kind of rattle each other up, right? Like you're anxious about something, so you're, you're talking to someone, but then it's like you're kind of dumping each other's anxieties on each other. Do you know what I'm talking about? And this isn't a judgment. It's just like some of us are wired this way and, and, and we try to process what's going on, but it's like, yeah, this thing, oh my goodness, that makes me so anxious, right? And you're just feeding this sort of wave of anxiety and stress and fear. And you walk away from that thinking, wow, I wanted to feel better after talking to someone that I love and I feel much worse. And it's not like they did anything intentionally mean. It's just like, we brought our, 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 our mess to each other and it just didn't get us very far. And Jesus says, look, you can be people who, who actually learn what it is to speak peace into those situations. Not to ignore situations, but to actually say, peace means that God is present with me in a way that gives me the resources I need to not let fear dominate who I am, to not let fear overtake my identity. Now, this isn't always easy, but often we, we can feed fear or we can invite fear to flee. And words have power to speak into situations. And your words matter. And here's a situation that I've been thinking about lately, like when you think about something like parenting, for instance, how we use our words matter. If you're in a relationship with children, and I've been challenged by this, even down to the tone of your voice, you are influencing the situation. What does, for instance, yelling words at someone who is small do? When you yell words at someone who's small, what you're doing is you're provoking fear. Now there's times to do that that makes a lot of sense, right? Small person running into traffic, you better make them afraid and afraid fast, right? Small person does something that irritates you. That's different, isn't it? Yeah. You see, the way we use our words, and, and you know, it's even more than that. It's the, the position in the relationship matters, right? Like I know, for instance, as, as, as a leader here, that how I talk to a teammate, if I come to them and say, hey, you're just doing a really bad job, and I don't know if you need, you know, like, like if I, <laughs> right? The weight of my words, because of my position, it's going to make a different kind of impact than someone else saying something like that. You, you get what I'm saying? So in all our relationships, we, we have to ask the question, how am I using the words that I use and am I using my words to help fear flee or to provoke fear as though 
that's what we're supposed to do. It leads me to a second reflection, and it's this. That instead of, you know, words of peace, sometimes we choose coercive words. So words of peace, not coercion. In other words, sometimes what we do, instead of saying peace be with you in our relationships, is we step into a space and we try and sort of like manipulate things so that they make us feel better about the situation. In other words, we, we might not even be clearly manipulative, but there are times when it's like, hey, I'm anxious, so I need to somehow fix this thing over here that this person in my life is going through. And I'm going to, sometimes we use a really good word, and, and, and this is an honest word sometimes, but we, we call coercion influence. I'm going to influence that person to alleviate my anxiety in the situation. Now, influence is good when it's done with integrity, but sometimes we deceive ourselves into believing that what we're doing in that moment is influence when in fact it's actually manipulation and coercion. One of the most beautiful things about Jesus is he does not manipulate. He does not coerce, he does not force. In fact, Jesus is like, you can do what you want, but I want you to follow me, but I'm not gonna make you follow me. But if you follow me, it's gonna be hard but it's gonna be good. And we sang of it this morning, didn't we? When we follow Jesus, the goodness of God follows. Have you ever felt like you were in a situation and it was hard and you were hoping in that moment that someone would listen with empathy would have perhaps helpful insights about how you might get some courage or some wisdom in the situation, but then instead, they just tried to fix, to coerce, to manipulate. You see, the words of Jesus, peace be with you, are an invitation to say, that is what I need so that I can be present in a different kind of way. I need peace, I need wholeness, I need shalom, I need truth, so that if there's anything that's breaking apart that web of relationships, I can be honest about it. But what I don't need is fear, and what I don't need is coercion. And so, what is it that we can do with this? Like, how might we hold this? Something I've been really reflecting on more and more in, like, small areas of my life is being sober-minded. And so I want to invite you to consider get sober-minded about the impact of your words. What do I mean by that? Get sober about the impact of your words. Well, what, what, what I mean is sometimes we don't actually recognize the the weight that our words have behind them in our relationships. And so I, I'm basically saying, actually sit and reflect on how you talk to people in your life and ask the question, is how I'm speaking impacting these people that I love for good or for ill? Getting sober about our words is not easy. Because what it does is it invites us to be critical and aware of our mess. I have a sense that there are lots of us in this room that struggle with how we talk to those folks in our lives. And what I hope you're seeing is that the invitation of Jesus is to say, okay, I, I, I could be like Jesus. I can use my words like Jesus if, in fact, I can be honest about how I'm currently using my words and how they might be causing 
harm instead of breathing life. You know, one of the powerful things about that story is Jesus says, peace be with you. And he breathes on them. And it's this first moment where the disciples actually encounter the Holy Spirit in a real kind of abiding way. And of course, that's going to be completed uh, about 50 day, days later. We have a story that we call uh, Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes and comes for good. And in this moment of peace and, and Jesus modeling how to use words when people are afraid, how to use words when people are struggling, he resources the people in the room. And he says, look, you aren't doing this peacemaking work alone. You aren't going to be a carrier of peace alone. My spirit will be with you. I wonder what this week could look like if you were to become more sober-minded about the way that you use your words. How might Jesus invite you to be a carrier and distributor of peace and wholeness in everyday situations. You see, when we can consider the impact of our words, we are invited to actually not just use words, but words that are carrying weight because we act in the same kind of manner. We don't just talk about being peace people. We are peace people by how we live and love as well. And so I want to invite us to imagine, not just for the sake of imagination, but actually because the people in our lives matter to God and they matter, hopefully, to you as well.